Hang on, I think I got something. Hey, buddy! Where's the fire? What? Well, I can't believe I'm saying this, fellas and fellow reds, but it seems that after all these years of living in a hopeless, joyless, cruel world held captive by the infamous video game movie Curse, it seems that this curse has finally, at long last, been broken. And the thing I can't believe even more is the video game movie that actually broke it. Here we have Sonic, a very unusual, outside-the-box film project which upon initial reveal was completely disregarded and ridiculed by pretty much anyone who cared enough to lay eyes on it. And now that it's finally here, it turns out that in reality it isn't anything it by video game movie logic should have been. It isn't terrible, it isn't bad, it isn't decent or even good, but instead, pretty freaking great. And overall, there's a big bunch of positive factors that contribute to this. The movie is really funny, it has heart, it has cool visuals, plus it also doesn't hurt that it's an opportunity for Jim Carrey to return to his former prime. Oh, I look like an imbecile. Of course I want a latte. I love the way you make them! In general, instead of this movie being just another cold IP cash grab like many others before it, it was clearly made by people who actually genuinely care. And look at the result. Hey, look at us. Who would have thought? Well, me. But all that aside, in order to make this video not be an hour long for your sake as well as mine, the thing I want to focus on today is the aspect of Sonic being the very first video game movie that broke the unbreakable curse of video game movies. Or at least the first one I've seen. And the way we're gonna do that is by taking Sonic and comparing it to a few other game movies that didn't manage to escape that lethal curse. And to be clear, the purpose isn't to compare it to the individual movies themselves, but more so to the different main fundamental failed video game movie qualities that they represent, which if described with single words would be obscurity, incompatibility and purposelessness. So let's throw on our fire red sneakers and race into the world of Sonic to see how it avoids the destructive effects of the infamous video game movie curse in a way that no others before it ever could. Here's how to make a great video game movie. The problem represented by game movies like Warcraft is that they lean too heavily on the source material, to the point of becoming one big obscure insider easter egg. We have a hero orc who's a kind of a good guy, we have a knight who's a knight, we have a king who's a king, a wizard who's a wizard and this place, and this place, and this place. Overall, the movie is such an overstuffed, convoluted mess of material pulled from this game universe that unless you are already familiar with it, you don't really get a close enough feel to it in terms of things like where we are or who people are or what it is that makes them who they are and so on and so on. And so you don't really get a chance to care. Or at least it's in I'm sorry, Major, what was your name? My name is Khadgar, I'm the guardian Nobody of Nobody cares! Nobody cares. And when Sonic begins, it begins in the exact same way. We have this massive, super exciting chase scene of Sonic running from our bad guy. Like the movie expects us to know who Sonic is and why he's running and why he's being chased by this guy. Which, unless we're Sonic insiders, we don't know. And therefore, for us, it doesn't work. Until the movie then does something to fix this issue. I know what you're thinking. Why is that hedgehog being chased by a madman with a mustache from the Civil War? Yeah, how the you know this? How? Hold on, bro. Before we get into all the big, loud game stuff, the movie chooses to keep its entire first act much smaller and more intimate to introduce us to our main characters, of which there are not a whole massive world full of, but basically only three. Firstly, the movie gives us a sense of who Sonic is. He's this fast, optimistic, kind-hearted goofball, and it is conveyed in a very clear way. But more importantly, because this knowledge of who Sonic is on the surface alone is isn't enough, the movie also spends time on diving into why he is who he is. Listen carefully, Sonic. You have a power unlike anything I have ever seen. And that means someone will always want it. The only way to stay safe is to stay 
hidden. In a nutshell, Sonic's greatest signature power of speed is also his greatest inner flaw. He wants nothing more than to come out of hiding and make friends in order to not be alone anymore. But as we've seen, him coming out of hiding carries destructive consequences, like when his own actions get his guardian killed, or when his own actions bring the bad guys on his tail. And now that we know what Sonic yearns for and why he yearns for it, now that we know what's standing in his way, we know fully who he is regardless of whether or not we knew anything about him before. And that's why we care. Same with our cop hero Tom. The film doesn't delve too deep into his past like with Sonic, but it still establishes him as a real three-dimensional person. Above all else, he feels hidden away in this tiny town and desperately wants to matter. And so when Sonic shows up to ask for his help, we understand his relationship with him, that Sonic is a way for him to matter. Same with our villain Robotnik. Right away, it's it's very clear that he's an arrogant, selfish D-bag who views himself above everyone else. But in addition to just that, the movie also gives us hints throughout the runtime to establish his deeper side. Nice. Rub that in my orphan face. The only other person who ever punched me in the face was the school bully. He hit me in the cafeteria, causing a blunt force contusion to the soft tissue surrounding my orbital bone. And I have never lost a fight again. You know what's hard about being the smartest person in the world? Everyone else is stupid. stupid. Yes! Essentially, Robotnik was made to feel inferior to everyone else throughout his early life, which has given him an obsession to prove that he's superior to everyone else. And now that this unknown alien has shown up to endanger that superiority, it's his mission to restore it. Overall, it's more than just this fast hedgehog is a fast hedgehog, this cop is a cop, this Jim Carrey is a Jim Carrey. The movie doesn't expect us to care for these characters just because they are these characters, but instead operates as if we knew nothing about them. But in addition to just character stuff, the movie also applies this mentality to everything else. Whenever it introduces events or places or easter eggs meant for fans, it also makes sure those events and places and easter eggs offer something to audiences who aren't fans. When Sonic hides away as a ball, it's not just, oh look, he's a ball like in the games, but it also sets up his ball form for later. When Sonic gets his red shoes, it's not just, oh look, those are Sonic's red shoes, but it's also a genuine heartfelt moment of the girl replacing his broken ones to show that she doesn't mind that he's an alien. When there's a joke about Sonic, it's also a joke about this crazy Carl character who plays a meaningful part later when Tom is able to explain Sonic to his girlfriend through him, as well as when he shows up to defend Sonic at the end to represent how the town is now on Sonic's side. And when the film does throw in easter eggs purely for the fans, like when it introduces this yellow Sonic from the Sonic universe, it saves them for the post credits, and instead overall makes the film itself focus primarily on this one specific aspect of the Sonic universe. What it doesn't do is take all these yellow and red and whatever Sonics from the Sonic lore and throw them and everything else into this one first movie expecting audiences to know and care about it all just because it's Sonic. Because for general moviegoers that doesn't work. On the other hand, we have film games like Assassin's Creed, where the fundamental game concept just doesn't feel compatible with film form. The main gist of AC is that there's this animus machine that allows you to relive the memories of your ancestors. And whereas in game form this works great because you are the one controlling the ancestor and their actions and their potential failures, as a movie where you're not in control, it kinda loses all of those established elements. We have our hero Cal reliving his ancestors' memories, but what does that mean exactly? Does Cal have to do something? Is he just an observing passenger like us? Can he fail? Are there any stakes to any of this? No clue. The result of which is that in the eyes of the audience, the movie just doesn't follow any clear established logic whatsoever and therefore doesn't work. What are these? What is this? What is this? What is it? What do you want from me? What happened in there? What does that mean? What the f is going on? 
And with Sonic, there should be a similar problem. I mean, we have this game where there's this anthropomorphic hedgehog running up and down a bunch of loops and hoops across various worlds, collecting rings as he's chased by this egg of a man in a flying UFO. And so, how the hell do you take this and turn it into live action feature form in a way that doesn't make the audience bleed brain cells from what they're watching? Well, here's how. This is Green Hills, the greatest place on Earth. These are my people, and dare I say, I am their lovable space creature. Sonic being entirely out of place next to real life film world humans is remedied with the fact that he actually is out of place. He's an alien from another universe. Okay, makes sense. And as for why he's collecting these weird rings, that's tied to his backstory as an alien from another universe as well as the overall plot. Those rings are universal teleporters that allow Sonic to hop between worlds. They are the thing he needs to get back in order to be able to leave Earth. So so far pretty coherent. As for Sonic's speed powers, the movie doesn't even try to go overly in depth on how fast he actually is, but just establishes a couple consistent general rules that remain unchanged throughout the runtime. Basically, Sonic is fast, like really fast, to the point where it doesn't matter how fast he actually is. And in addition to that, it's also established how Sonic perceives the world when he is being fast. And even though it is fair to say that it's basically just a copy paste of Justice League, which is basically just a copy paste of X-Men, it still is very necessary because we need to understand how the speed powers work in practice to be able to understand what the hell is happening when Robotnik is chasing Sonic using his own speed powers against him. And speaking of Robotnik, how do we take this UFO flying egg of a man and bring him into the real world? Well, we make him into an eccentric government scientist with a deep inner three-dimensional insecurity like we talked about before. We take his UFOs and make them into real life drones. Plus, we cast Jim Carrey. And there we go, it all adds up. In essence, whatever game element Sonic the movie uses, it always establishes them under very specific logical rules that fit the world and the tone of this live action adaptation. What is this? Oh, he, uh, he suffers from a very rare skin disease that stunts his growth and makes him look like that. What do you want from me? I have no idea where I'm going. What is this? It's a flight suit designed to modulate my body temperature and reduce drag. What does that mean? It's a payphone. And those establishing logical rules are very crucial, because without them, any game elements that you introduce will most likely end up becoming incompatibly illogical, to the point where you'd get the same exact impact by just not introducing them or making the movie at all. Last, and in some sense the least, are competent video game movies like Tomb Raider, which don't crumble down because of what they do, but more so because of what they don't do. See, Tomb Raider isn't a bad film. It doesn't have a Warcraft problem of convoluted obscurity. It doesn't have an Assassin's Creed problem of illogical incompatibility. But it does have a problem of being a lazy, undeserving recreation of the 2013 game it's based on. The core of the plot is the same. The core of the characters is the same. The the core of the setting and sequences and theme is the same. The core of the movie is the same as the core of the game. And any changes that have been made are pretty much all superficial. And at that point, no matter how competent you are, if you're not exploring anything new and worthy, if you're just filming a cinematic equivalent of a game that already is cinematic, if you're just making a movie in order to milk an existing product for more cash, then aside from your financial gain, what's the point? The the answer is, there isn't one, and the movie in question might as well not exist. And as for the Sonic movie, this factor of doing something new and worthy might actually be its greatest strength of all. Because like we talked about, the games are all about running up and down a bunch of loops collecting these rings for some reason, and that's pretty much it. Stop! And the fact that the source material is this furthest thing from a narrative-driven movie, it forces the filmmakers to actually come up with something that doesn't yet exist, which is exactly what they did. They took the heart of the Sonic franchise and they fit that into the world of a feature film adaptation, yes. But most importantly, they did so in a way that explores situations and questions the games have never done. Obviously, there's a bunch of surface-level stuff you can list out, like the fact that this is a buddy road trip 
comedy, which is a far cry from running up and down a bunch of loops. And that's true. But I'd say the most crucial narrative aspect this movie explores is its central thematic question. The question of friendship. You're going to a safe world. A nice safe world full of mushrooms. Mushrooms that'll be your only friends. It's gonna be tough to leave my hometown and all my friendships. But this is something I feel like I need to do. Deep down, you are still rather lonely. Perhaps afraid you'll be alone forever. Like I mentioned before, the thing Sonic wants most as a character is to stop hiding himself and his powers and instead reveal himself fully to the world in order to make friends. But the reason he can't just do that is because anytime he does reveal himself and his powers, bad things happen, indicating that friendship is bad. And in a similar manner, Tom also struggles with the same thematic question, when he thinks that the only way for him to truly matter is to go be a cop in a big city. Then on the opposite side, we have Robotnik, who represents the anti-theme of isolation. He prefers living and interacting with only his machines, because due to the poor way humans treated him as a child, he views humans and friendships as nothing but a weakness in need of overcoming. Human beings are unreliable and stupid and I care very little about them. But my machines are diligent, relentless. They're everything to me! That's why I don't have friends. You know what I love about machines? They do what they're told. But then at the end, the movie finally gives the correct answer to this thematic question, when Sonic defeats Robotnik thanks to his friends as well as his adamant will to fight for them, proving once and for all that friendships aren't a weakness, but instead a strength. And he was my friend. This is my power, and I'm not using it to run away anymore. I'm using it to protect my friends. And it's this explored thematic question what this movie is about. It's this explored thematic question what you ultimately remember this movie for. And if your movie doesn't have one, if it just does the same thing something else has already done, what is there to remember it by? And if your answer is that it's remembered for being the same as something else, fair enough, but with that thought process I might as well just go give my money and attention to that something else.